Hi, and welcome to our new weekly Soul of the Parsha class. We are now starting a new book in the five books of the Torah, the book of Shemot, Exodus. And this is our first parasha, which is also called Shemot, of course. Uh, as usual, we're focusing on the first segment of the parasha, and our uh, topic for today is how to discover and reveal the king within you, how to attain, how to build your own personal kingdom. In a way, each and every one of us needs to be a king of sorts. We are given responsibility over a certain aspect of the world, the territory of our lives, the people around us, the extent of our responsibility. All of this is like our kingdom, and we need to take care of it as a good king or queen. So this raises a big question, how do we become a good king or queen? What does it mean to manifest our kingship within our kingdom, within this realm that we were assigned to? So this is our topic for today. Um, looking at this Parsha and the first segment of it, it starts, first seven verses are really just a summing up of the previous book, the book of Genesis, or the end of the book of Genesis. It starts with recounting the coming of the people, the sons of Israel, to the land of Egypt following Yosef. And then it again recounts uh, the death of Yosef and the fact that the Jewish people become, started growing significantly within the land of Egypt. Um, something we didn't go into before is that the the first segment of each parsha, and this is this only applies for the first segment, uh, splits into three sub-segments. And that's how they're read in weekdays. When the Torah is read on Mondays and Thursdays, the first segment is split into three. So these first seven uh, verses are just the first sub-segment of the first segment. So the second sub-segment, this is where really the book of Exodus begins, because this is where the new plot, the new occurrences begin to happen. And it all starts in verse 8, in the verse, first I'm going to read it in Hebrew, Vayakam melech hadash al Mitzrayim asher lo yada et Yosef, a new king arose over Egypt, over Egypt who did not know Joseph. So this is our, uh, our topic for today, this verse. We're going to focus on this verse and the combination of words. What does it mean that there was a new king? What does it all mean? And... And from this, we're going to learn something about, as I said, kingship and kingdom. So we're going to start with looking at the word, the Hebrew word for new, chadash. Very interestingly, this is the first time this word appears in the Torah. Throughout the book of Genesis, this uh, word, and in fact this root, and including all variations of this root, the root chadash, new, never appeared, although Genesis is all about everything being new, the world is new, it's created for the first time, um, the appearance of Abraham is a novelty, it's a chidush, it's something that didn't occur before, uh, everything that's going on is new, and the world is fresh, we can even say, it's fresh in the making, and in fact, when you think about it, the uh, traditional Hebrew term for the very idea of there being a beginning to time, as opposed to the ancient pagan, also in, in Greek philosophy concept, that the universe, the cosmos, is eternal. It has always existed, uh, which really is about making this world almost the divine instead of separating this, the created world from its creator. So the very Hebrew concept for the idea that the world is created versus the idea that it had always existed is that the world is mechudash, that it's, it's new. It, it had a beginning in time. But this word does not appear in Genesis at all. And it only appears for the first time right here in the beginning of Exodus. And in a way, we can explain this by saying that uh, when, in order for something to be considered new, things need to be old first. Uh, things need to acquire a certain habit or become, we need to get used to them. They need to solidify or to become um, 
uh, static. And then, or even we can even say to stagnate maybe a little bit. And then on, on, against this backdrop of things not renewing, of things remaining as they are and, and constricting us and, and limiting us and sort of freezing or stagnating into something that's solid, Against this backdrop can there be a chidush, a novelty, a change. So this is why the word for new appears in the Torah only in the second book, not in the first book. And of course, what has solidified or what has stagnated or what has be, been constricted or been limited and now is it needs this kind of renewal, it's the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, coming into the land of Egypt and starting to um, to make it their new home. And it's not their new home. It's not their real home. It's, it's a diaspora. So being in this situation of the Hebrew people not being on their own turf, being in a foreign land, which isn't theirs, and becoming used to that place, that this is the place that you forget what you are really about, who you are really about, where you're supposed to be, where you can truly manifest your own unique self and un your unique vision and to bring about, you know, your, your calling into the world, manifest your calling. When you're far away from all of this, it means that you've, be you've, becoming, you've become accustomed, accustomed, so you've become accustomed to a diaspora to a state of alienation, to a state of being far away from where you should be. And, and this is where renewal is needed. There needs to be a renewal. Something needs to be to change, to break these shackles. Of course, the renewal here is negative. It's a new evil king. It's not a good king. But, the, just, but, but before even going into that, the fact that this word appears... Is teaches us something about novelty and about where we are in this story, in the story that the Torah is telling us. That the first book, which is all about the patriarchs, the fathers of Judaism and monotheism, they came into the world and it was all new. But now their children, their descendants, may be forgetting who they are, what they need to do. And now a and because, we can even say, because they're not renewing themselves in a good way, the renewal comes in, the, you know, in an unexpected and negative way. It comes from Pharaoh. It comes from Egypt. They're the ones renewing or presuming to renew. It's all just a reflection of the fact that we are not renewing ourselves. This is something very interesting to bear in mind. If we're not going to reinvent ourselves every once in a while, this is Egypt. Egypt is a place that was good for the time being. It was a place, it was a refuge from the hunger. And it was a, it was a place that could, could you know, uh, uh, give us a place to stay and some things to eat, and it helped us grow. And it's like a womb. That's, that's the, uh, the, always the metaphor, that Egypt was like a big womb that they enable the Jewish people who came only as a small group, small little little tribe really of, of 70 people, they grew in this womb into a whole nation with 12 tribes. It's a, it's a, that, so it was like a womb. But there comes a point when the pregnancy needs to end. This is the point in each and every uh, episode of our lives that we need to reinvent ourselves or renew ourselves. It's a time really to be born or reborn. And at this point, the womb becomes, turns from something protective and positive that shelters us, that shields us. It becomes something that limits us, that traps us, that constrains us. This is what mit, the Hebrew word for Egypt, Mitzrayim, means. It means Mitzrayim, constraints. So, so the the so the the point that I'm making here is that if we don't re, when the time comes to reinvent ourselves if we don't do this there will be a reinvention there will be new things it's not going to come from us it's going to come from a negative source outside of us so you'd better reinvent or renew yourself first on your own terms 
uh, and in accordance to what you really want and who you really are, and not let it be done for you in, in some negative way. So that's the first point we can, we can get from this. So the word new appears for the first time. What is the new thing? It's a new king. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. There's a famous debate within the sages, Rav and Shmuel, two uh, later sages of the Talmud period, and they're debating whether it's literally new, that is, the old pharaoh, the pharaoh that loved Joseph, that instated him as the second in, uh, in command, and, and gave him the, 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 all the authority they gave him, he passed away, and a new pharaoh came along instead of him. That's one opinion. That's a simple, literal reading of the text. And another opinion is that it was the same pharaoh, the same one, but he changed his attitude. And he started alienating himself from, from Joseph. Joseph passed away, but once he passed away, he started alienating himself from Joseph's family, that is, from the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, uh, that are still in Egypt. And he acted as if he did not know Joseph. That This is the second interpretation. Two interpretations. Uh, but before going into this, uh, it, we, we need to sort of pause for a little bit about the fact that the first new thing in, in the Torah, the first thing to be described as new, is a king. There must be, there's a, there's a general principle in, in when studying the Torah, that the first appearance of a word teaches us something fundamental about the nature of that word or the concept that the word alludes to. So the fact that the new, the, the first thing termed new in the Torah is a king, tells us that there is a some inner connection between novelty, renewing, reinventing, and kingship or kingdom or the property, the attribute of being a king. There is some sort of connection, and we need to figure this out. And there's another very big clue that we're on the right track. And that is that when you look for the first appearance of the verb to renew, here, new is an adjective, a new king. But what about the verb, lechadesh, to renew, or to make something new? Uh, that only appears for the first time in the first book of Samuel, chapter 11, verse um, 14, when Samuel, the prophet, is about to uh crown the first king of Israel, King Saul, Shaul HaMelech. When they're about to do this, King Saul says, let us go to Gilgal, that's the name of a place, and renew the kingdom. Actually, renew is not the best of translations. In Hebrew, it's Nechadesh HaMelucha. It means to instate the kingdom, or the kingship of Saul, for the very first time, because this is the first king in the history of Israel. So this is amazing. This is the, the first time the word chadash, new, appears as an adjective. It surrounds a king, a negative king, Pharaoh. Um, and the first time that the verb lechadesh, to renew or to do something new for the first time, uh, also appears in the context of uh, coronation, the coronation, the, the, the uh, proclaiming of Saul as king. So this is a positive king, or at least he starts out positively, and he later on he he also becomes not a good king, and and David takes his place. So there is some deep connection, and we need to figure out why is newness or novelty associated with uh, with kingship. So we we need to start out by saying that malchut kingdom or kingship, is also the name of one of the Kabbalistic sefirot, the Kabbalistic emanations, right? The Kabbalah talks about the tree of life. Tree of life is the structure of ten emanations, ten sefirot, that are the blueprint of all creation. This is what God uses in order to create creation and also constantly recreate it. Apropos what we said before, uh, reinventing or renewing, the it's, it's the creation is something constant. It's not just that it was created in the beginning of time, it's constantly recreated. That means that the Kabbalistic Sefirot are constantly present in our lives, in everything in the world. They are the hidden map 
of, of creation and of the soul and of processes within the soul and within creation and so on. Malchut, which again could be translated as kingdom or kingship, is the last final tenth emanation, tenth sefirah, counting from the top down. The final one is called Malchut. Now the idea is that these sefirot are divine by nature, but the final one, the one, the, the one called Malchut, is unique in the sense that it goes down, so to speak, into creation itself, and through it, God governs everything down here. The other sefirot are also present, and they're reflected in everything, but in their nature, they are part of, the, of the, what is called the world of emanation, Olama Atzilut, which is the highest of all spiritual worlds, and it's a, it, this is a world of, of pure divine consciousness, we can call this. So all the sefirot that are above Malchut are, are embedded completely in this world of emanation. But the final last one goes down into this world and is also constantly in risking being disconnected from its source. Now, what's special about this sefirah, the, other than this, and it goes together with this, is that it goes, it goes into a very deep question, which is, in a way, why did God create the world? So it's a big question. We don't really know the answer. There are all kinds of answers. But one of the answers we can say is that by creating a world, God discovers something new about himself. God creates a world in order for the world to surprise him, in order for the world to in order to maybe perceive himself from another perspective. So by creating a world, it's, it's, it's a famous idea that God is playing hide and seek with the world. He's hiding, so we look for him. And it's this hiding of his face is very deliberate. And so this means that once we find him, or every time, every moment, each one of us rediscovers God in his life, in his or her life, and or 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 go or or rediscovers God in the world, or rediscovers God in general, uh, this process of, of rediscovering God tells God something new about himself. It's when you perceive yourself from the outside, you learn something new about yourself, when you meet yourself, so to speak, for the first time. So God is creating the world in order to sort of re-perceive himself in a new light, in a new fashion, from a new perspective that he wouldn't have had had he remained in his infinite perfection. So he needs to create an imperfect world for this imperfect world to look for him and find him. And, and then a novelty, a chidush, something new happens. So this is a very deep connection between malchut and novelty or renewing or newness. That by creating this perspective that goes into the world and, and distances itself from God, it can suddenly go back and re-perceive God. So and it, 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 it's a way, it's a bit like we, we get married and we have children, and then the children, they're younger than us, they don't know as much as we do, they don't understand the world as much as we do, but they, they teach us new things all the time. When a child teaches us new things, or a student, a pupil, teaches the teacher a new thing, this is a bit like the universe as a whole, creation as a whole, teaching the Creator something new. So this is the point that has to do with Malchut. This is called that God emanates a certain light. This is called the straight light. And then there's a, the light is reflected back at him. And this reflective light is also, again, something new, something novel. So Malchut, this is, the, we're beginning to understand the connection between Malchut, the Sefirah, the Kabbalistic Sefirah, and novelty or newness or reinventing, reinvention, so on. Now, another thing we need to understand is that Malchut is very much connected to the one sphera before it, the, the one before last sphera. This is called the sphera of Yesod, which translates as foundation. Foundation is like a funnel or a channel that takes all the light and energy and content and um, you know motion of all the higher sefirot, and funnels it, channels it into Malchut. If Malchut is not to be 
dissociated, disconnected from its source, it needs to cling to your soul. Now, this fear of your soul foundation is associated with the image of the tzaddik. Tzaddik is the righteous individual. Every holy, righteous uh, man, a servant of God, is a tzaddik. He, ob- he believes in God, he observes the Torah, the commandments, and he dedicates his life really to God. This is a tzaddik. So the yesod is the tzaddik foundation. This goes along with the verse called the tzaddik yesod olam. The righteous man is the foundation of the world. This is why foundation is like a tzaddik. And he needs to be above the malchut, and the malchut needs to be a recipient of the yesod. That's the simplest way to imagine this is that, we, is that every king should have a righteous man, a holy teacher, above him to teach and guide him. And if he has that, then this is a good king with a good kingdom, because then the kingdom is connected to the, to the assault of the foundation, to the tzaddik that's above it. And this really promises that the kingdom will be run by a good king. And this is, we can even trans- actually translate this to politics, that if there is a leader who is not in some way, uh, f- he doesn't follow or he doesn't heed the advice of a wise uh, man that's connected to wisdom, to religion, to serving God, to faith in God, uh, he will become a bad king. He could start out a good king and then he will become a bad king. Or he, or he starts out as a bad king. But, if, but a, a good king would have constantly be seeking the counsel of righteous, good, holy uh, God, servants of God. Now, th- what was the verse that we are, we're learning now? It's a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Joseph is the archetypal righteous man. He was more righteous than his brothers who sold him. He maintained his righteousness in Egypt. And through his righteousness, he was given the wisdom of interpreting the dreams of the Egyptians. And he maintained his purity and righteousness throughout his years in a very, very unholy place. And and also he was able to control himself and and, uh, not succumb to the seduction of the wife of Potiphar. That's another symbol of being very righteous. So Yosef is called Yosef HaTzadik, Yosef the Righteous. That's how Jewish tradition calls him. There arose a new king who did not know Joseph describes a malchut, a, a kingdom, that disconnects itself from its root, from its source in the in the tzaddik, in the in the righteous man, in in the found in the in the emanation of uh, of foundation. So this is very beautiful. We we now have the kabbalistic terminology enables us to re understand this verse in a kabbalistic way. That the new king, a king, the, the property of being a king is something very powerful. There's even in in Judaism when you see a a, a non Jewish king uh, who has nothing to do with Judaism. There's a blessing you need to say when you see that king, because if someone w- was given this power of being a king, that's not something to be taken lightly. He was given a, a divine uh, power, divine blessing in a way, even if he's not a good king. But, but, so, but, but when this uh, property or blessing is abused, that is when the king does not have a righteous man, above him, as Pharaoh before, whether it was the same one or a different one, the Pharaoh before had Yosef. He realized that there's no one wiser than you, and I want to, everything you tell me, I'm going to do. And this is a, that's why the first Pharaoh was a good Pharaoh. But he was either replaced or he changed into a bad Pharaoh who, know, who forgot about Yosef, which is really forgetting about this obligation to divine uh, wisdom. So this is, of course, a very, very, uh, this is the negative kingship that the, the, the verse uh, uh, tells us about. However, 
we we could we could finish the the class now. We could say, okay, so now we understand better why the the second pharaoh uh, was not a good pharaoh. We have a good explanation that that's coming out of this uh, understanding of this filot and this disconnection of malchut from its uh, from its source. But there's actually something more to be learned from this verse. Every negative verse or idea or entity in the world has a positive counterpart. This is called God created the world as being made out of polar opposite counterparts and they reflect one another. So when you have something negative, you can negate it. It's good to negate it. You need to, It's negative, so you need to negate it. But if you really want to get what you need from that, you need to look for its positive counterpart. And the, in fact, this negative thing, or entity, or event, uh, can actually teach you a great deal about how to rectify it. Because it, it's like a, an inverse reflection, or a negative version, negative in the sense of, you know, positive, negative, Images, uh, it's it's the it's the it's the mirror image of what you do need to work on or to to obtain. So since this is the first appearance of the word chadash, new, and it goes al- along with the idea of being a king, uh, although it's negative, although it was a very bad king, and he starts, of course, trying to. Uh, to do a kind of genocide or semi-genocide by killing all the all the Jewish uh, men, as negative as evil as he is, maybe the epitome of 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 evil in in the way in the Torah. There's something about him that teaches us about the positive rectified kind of kingship that we do want and need and should aspire to. So it means completely reversing it. But when you completely reverse something, something about its pattern remains the same, except it's now it's turned upside down. So we want to now learn from this verse something about the positive version of kingship. And we want to take it all in the direction of how each and every one of us in our own lives uh, should be a king. You know, there are many reasons for this. You know, there are many leaders and we're very hopeful of them, and we're very, we trust in them, and, and many times they disappoint us. And hopefully we will all marry to, to find the best of leaders, and we should all marry that Mashiach will come, and he will be the perfect leader for all mankind. But until that happens, what we can all do is we should all strive to be the best kings or queens that we can be. Over our limited, small, humble kingdom, which is the domain of our lives. So this is where we want to take all this, uh, uh, in, this is the direction we want to go now. Now, where am I taking this idea that each one of us is a king? So we're going back now to the Sefirot. So we said that this map of the ten emanations, ten Sefirot, eh, they're all divine emanations with the final one going into the world. But we also said they all reflect all over creation. And they, and they also reflect, and this is very, very primary for uh, Hasidus, for the, the way Hasidim, Hasidut, the way we learn Torah, is that the Sefirot are also manifested in our own souls, in our own psyches. The structure of our own souls echoes, reflects the, all the ten divine emanations as they are in the world of emanation. They are also within us. So if we make this uh, transition then all the sefirot down to, but not including malchut, are within us. They are, they're all have to do with our own inner personality traits and thought processes and emotional growth. But the final one, just as the sphere of malchut goes, God's sphere of malchut goes down, kingdom, into this world and governs it, our own private sphere of kingdom or kingship goes out into our own world and makes our personality, our character traits, uh, our decisions, they manifest it. So it's a part of us that goes out into the world and 
and it becomes a sort of aura. It reflects outside into who we are and, and, and what we are all about. And all this is, it manifests in what we do. So the first ten sefirot, as seen as soul powers, are all within us. But the final one uh, emanates outside of us, and, 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 and if we work properly, it becomes a proper reflection of who we are. And in fact, although it's the final, last, lowest of sefirot, it's intimately and directly connected to the highest of all sefirot. And what is the name of that sefirah? It's called Crown. The final sefirah is called Kingdom. The first sefirah is called Ketel, Crown. Crown is a sefirah that's also, in a way, outside of us, but in a, in a different way. It's what we call our superconscious. Just like a crown is over our head, the sphere of crown within us is above us. It's our soul root. The crown is our soul root, and crown, kingdom, the two terms go together. The kingdom that we build, that we make, the lives we make, uh, what we make of our lives, is a revelation of our hidden, high, invisible crown. So in order for the crown, the crown can never appear. It's too hidden, it's too modest, it's too subtle, it's too high, it's too secretive. But it, the, the, the crown can be re revealed via the kingdom, which is what we make of our lives outside of us. Now, we, now I want to uh, share the screen and share with you a very uh, fundamental, very important Kabbalistic structure which really could, could really help us uh, understand what we're all about. This uh, structure is called Shangala. Shangala is the acronym for five Hebrew words, and we're going to go over them. It's really a kind of very simple, very basic, concise model of how we are made up, what we are made up of. And the idea is that there are five levels here, and we're going to go over them from the top down, and each level is a kind of garment or vessel for the level that's above it. So let's go over this and, and, we'll, and we'll understand this. So the first level is called Shorish, which means root. This is the root of our souls. This is a, a root that is hidden. It's the root of it's our innermost, deepmost essence. It's like the kernel of our being. This is the root. The root manifests or is enclosed by the soul. Our soul is a grows out of and covers, just like you know the circles in the tree, they cover the original circles. Then the soul encloses or manifests the root. The root is more hidden than the, the soul is also hidden. But the root is even more hidden. So we have the soul and above it, within it, the soul root. But as we said, the soul is also invisible. A soul is disembodied. It needs, a, it needs something, a vessel. The soul is a vessel for the root, but the soul also needs a vessel. The vessel for the soul, soul is neshama. The vessel for the soul is the goof. This is how you should read this, uh, this Hebrew word. Uh, I, I couldn't find a way of, uh, of uh, spelling it without it sounding goofy, so I used the letter U. So it's pronounced goof. Goof is body. So root is the root of the soul is enclosed by the soul, and the soul is enclosed by the body. The body becomes the vessel for the soul. Each level here is the way of that level to manifest itself in reality. The root manifests in a soul, and the soul manifests itself in a body. But a body is also not enough. We are born with a soul and a body, but we can't present ourselves to the world without, we're not animals that go or walk around naked, uh, we are civilized human beings. We're the uh, cultural, we're the cultured animal. We're an animal that goes along with, with having, you know, tools and, and vessels that we build, that we make for ourselves. So the body is enclosed in a levush, which means garment. Our garments which, by the way, we can absolutely expand. It's not just the physical clothes we wear, it's what we do, it's how we speak. Even in a way, the Hasidu talks about a, the garment of 
thought, the, a thought being a kind of garment. So it, it's, a thought would appear to be inside the body, but it's not really true, because we place our soul and our body, our, our existence, our holistic existence, both soul and body, within a certain sphere of thoughts and words and actions and physical clothes. And the physical clothes are also a reflection of, of who we are, what we believe in, what we identify with, and so on. So the garment, again, as a symbol of, as a statement, we can say, when you, when you dress in a certain manner or you put on certain clothing, you're making a statement. So this is a manifestation of everything that came before it, of the body and the soul and the, and the soul root. Finally, and this is the most interesting one, it doesn't end with a garment. We would think, well, this is where it ends. Everything is in clothes until we are human beings who wear clothes. No, that's not true. There is a fifth level, and this is the level of Heichal, which is a palace. A palace is what we, after being, after dressing up and coming out into the world, it's not enough for our soul root to fully manifest itself in this world. We need not just to put on a garment, we need to build a certain heichal, a certain hall or palace around us. And this is the final, final revelation of everything that came before it, up to and starting with, and in primarily including the soul root. And in fact, there is a very deep connection, as I said before, between the highest and the lowest levels, because the level of the soul root is associated, and you can see this in the, in the smaller letters, with the level of, with the sphere of crown, and the palace is associated, or corresponds, to the sphere of kingdom, of Malchut. So, there is, although the Heichal, the palace, is, a, is a, as, far, as far as you can get from the soul root, because the soul root is the most hidden, and the Heichal is the most revealed palace. But this palace manifests and reflects our own, uh, ultimately, our own soul root. And you can think about someone, you know, what is the palace? What is our palace? When we're talking about each one becoming a king, and a king needs, needs, a, needs a palace, um, what is a palace? A palace is, we can, we can talk about several things. One would be the home that you build. If you build a home, if it's your own home, or if you're renting a place, but you're designing it the way you like, this, in a way, is your palace. It reflects something very deep about your soul root, about what, how, you, how you perceive space, and how you perceive the world, and how you want to live. So your house is, and you know, turning a house into a home where you feel at home means that it's deeply connected to your soul root. It could also be a website, you know, a website as a home page. It's like a home. When one is building a website for oneself, one is creating a kind of a kind of palace for oneself. It could be your life's work. It could be your the biggest passion project of your life. The thing that you do because you really believe in it and you want to give it to the world, it's coming out into the world. It's not just a garment, it's a kind of palace that you built. There's something very interesting that if you think about it, the highest level and the lowest level are also, in a way, but for totally different reasons, the most invisible levels. Right? We're born with a soul and a body, but very quickly we're being put in, in garments, and most of the day, not just outside the home, but usually inside the home as well, we put on garments. And so the three levels of soul, body, and garment are, are very much there from the very beginning, or they're very much, they make up what we are and who we are. But the root is absolutely invisible, because, it, as I said, it's so modest and secretive. And the palace also doesn't appear until we build it. So I said, totally different reason, opposite reason. The root is always there, but hidden. The palace, that's up to us. If we, if we translate our soul root and our soul and our body and our garments, which is our actions and our words and everything, if we put it all together and we channel it all together, we... Uh, we can turn our world, whatever it is that we have that we can influence, into a kind of kingdom, a kind of palace that honors our soul root. So, uh, looking at this idea, this is very 
teaches us something very, very deep about the idea that each one of us should be a king or a queen. We each, all of us have a crown, we each have a crown, it's hidden, you don't see it. If you look closely at other people, you can see their crown, it's like an aura above their head, it's what they're good at, it's what they're unique at, it's what they're most special at, it's what makes them absolutely unique individuals. But this uniqueness is very subtle and internal. It's not the how loud you speak or how you know funny you are. It's something that is almost, um, you know, it's almost you can see it. It comes across when you're not trying hard. It's it's who you are when you when you're not straining yourself to be special. It's who it's, you were special anyway, and this specialty, this uniqueness, this novelty of who you are. It's already there, and when you're just focused on doing your thing, it'll come across. And if you marry it, it you 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 will build a palace. You will build a palace in the world that will be a reflection of your soul root. Now, we still haven't figured out how we're going to learn from this very negative verse about there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Uh, how we can translate this into something positive, because everything we've learned so far is that not knowing Joseph, i.e. being disconnected from a tzaddik, a righteous person, a teacher, a guide, God, the Torah, um, uh, everything that needs to guide you in the world, uh, is negative. All this is very, very bad. But the thing is this, when we go down from all the levels that we saw, down to building our palace, which is, uh, again, manifesting in the world our calling, our mission, our duty, our purpose in life. We're going into an unknown realm. It's a terra incognita. As I said before, it doesn't exist. The, so all the levels are there. The garment is the beginning of something that we need to figure out for ourselves. You know, we're given certain garments by our parents, but then we also need to decide for ourselves if we want to preserve them, or replace them, or change them, or modify them. But it's but it, it, we're working with something we already have. We were given a garment, we have habits, and we have, you know, we, our personality is made up by things, and now we're, we're working on it, we're changing it all the time. But the, the palace is totally not there. And so when we're going there, in a way, we're going into the unknown. Again, the verse is, there arose a new king who did not know Joseph. Let's put Joseph aside for a second. Just this connection, a new king who did not know, th this in itself teaches us something very, very deep. There's something about being a king, turning ourselves into kings, finally coming into our fullness as kings of our own lives, that has to do with not knowing. Why? Because it's connected to the soul root that's super conscious, that's above consciousness, above knowing, above knowledge. We, we're not sure how this house or, or homepage in our website or uh, life project or the next big thing we're going to work on, we're not going to sure how it's going to come out. We're not sure how it's going to look like. We're not sure of ourselves. Because this is the ultimate goal of our lives. It connects to the deepest essence within us. And we don't know our own essence. There's something very important. We don't, one cannot recognize one's own soul root. As I said before, it comes about almost casually. It comes when you're not trying. It's unknowable. This is, the, the soul root is called the unknowable head of the soul. It, it's unknowable even to our own selves. So there's something here that we don't know how it's going to, to operate. Now, this king does not know Joseph. So this, again, it, this is negative. When, we're, when we want to be kings, good kings, we, we shouldn't be rebellious kings that presume to know everything, to uh, not to heed anyone's advice. The very opposite. We need to be kings that are connected to a channel of, of holiness, of light, of Torah teaching, of uh, someone who gives us uh, serves as a model for serving God, and we have to have this. So we have to have a Joseph, that Joseph 
It could be a, an actual righteous man that exists in the world or, or existed until preferably not too long ago so that he knows the world that we live in and he serves as a model for us. And the best, actually, would be to have both a, a dead tzaddik and a, and a living tzaddik, one that's dead and another one that's alive, that you need both, and you can get something from either one. And it also means being connected to tradition and to religion and all this. But the thing is, once we get to building our own kingdom, a surprise will happen that will even surprise ourselves and even surprise this holy source of us. And in fact, that's what this holy source, this tzaddik or, the, or God, everything that, that the foundation symbolizes, wants to be surprised. So there is a sense in which when it comes to building our own unique palace, finding our own unique vocation, our own unique voice in the world, there is always an element that this kingship or kingdom does not know Joseph in the sense that it surprises Joseph. That it, it, doesn't, it's not, it doesn't all come from him. I'm not just a copy cat. I'm not just you know, doing everything that I was told to do. I'm absolutely trying to be a continuation of something bigger than myself. This is the sense of knowing Joseph, of, of, of being Malchut, under founda- kingdom under foundation. But, there, but even in the holiest version, the most rectified, positive version, of this structure, the Malchut is going to surprise everyone, including ourselves, and there will be an element, even in the uh, rectified holy counterpart of this evil pharaoh, in which this palace will be will come as a surprise to everyone. And this is our most unique self. So, let's put it simply, I, I, I'm a chosid of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He's my Rebbe. I also have a living Rav, and I have teachers from other generations and this generation, and of course, above, above all of them is God. And I'm just trying to do what they, they want me to do, or tell me to do. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be a good servant of God. I'm trying to be a good chosid of my Rebbe. I'm trying to be a good pupil uh, of my Rav. And I'm doing all of this. But ultimately, when you get to building your home, or your Chabad house, you can say, or your life's project, or your website, or all of this, there is something, if you don't want it to be, if you really want it to reflect your unique soul root, then there will be something unique about it. There will be something new about it. There will be something novel about it. There will be something original about it. Not because you're trying to be original. Trying to be original is the worst thing in the world, maybe, and you end up being the most unoriginal you can be. That's what happens when you try hard to be original. But the thing is, that if you try to be a a good king, following a righteous man or wisdom's advice, and you follow that, and, and, you, and you really go all the way with it, it, it will be original. Your soul root, will ref- your unique soul root will reflect, and you will build a palace that has never been, has never been, been built before, that no one has ever seen before. So there will be an element in which there is an element always that Malchut is both a continuation of Yesod, the kingdom is a continuation of foundation, and at the same time, it disconnects from foundation. It, re, it, it creates and manifests something new, and this is the best thing that could happen. This is what it was all about. This is why we were given unique soul roots and were put into the world in order to finally, at a certain moment in our life, build a certain palace that God would be surprised, positively surprised by, and say, oh, wonderful, this is is why I gave you a sword root for. I gave it to you so you can build a palace in which you are the king, you're you're a reflection of of God's own kingship, but it also has your unique mark or flavor or, you know, uh, shade to it. So, uh, and this really is, this goes to the thing we said in the beginning, that there are two interpretations for this concept of new king. One is that he, it was the same king who knew Yosef, but something changed about him. So for Pharaoh, it changed for the bad, but for us, it changes for the good. 
So we know Yosef, we're connected to Yosef, but it's also we we create a variant. There's there's new the 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 new the 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 old Pharaoh had new laws. So the it's it's still me connecting to my tzaddik, but I when it comes down to the details, I'm changing things because this is who I am. This is the way I do things. I'm not the same as other chosids of the Rebbe. I'm not the same as other Jews. I'm not the same as anyone. And I have my way of doing things, and that's wonderful. That's okay. That's how it's supposed to be. And the other interpretation, the more radical one, or the, well, in, in the Torah, it's the, it's the more literal one, but here it's the more radical one, that it's a new king. That if we preserve this balance, it'll be completely new. It'll both be a complete continuation of what came before me, and of the teachings that I follow, and of my teachers and rabbis, and, and it'll both be something absolutely new that the world um, did not see before. So this is where we end. This is our uh, our message, our teaching uh, for this week's Parsha, Parsha Shmot. In a way, it connects also to the name of the Parsha. Shmot means names. It starts with the names of the sons of Israel who came into Egypt. They're all sons of Israel, but they, each one has his own unique name. Shabbat Shalom, everyone, and I'll see you next week. Hi, if you enjoyed this video, please press like and subscribe to the channel. Also, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Patreon is a platform for supporting independent creators. You can find the link in the description below. Thank you very much.